Okay, so uh, let's start this evening's talk. Uh, it's going to be on the idea of freedom. Uh, and uh, the idea of freedom is a very important one uh, on the Buddhist path. Uh, yeah, it's the kind of thing that uh, kind of goes throughout the suttas. You hear about freedom from the very beginning uh, all the way to the very end of the path. Uh, and you have important words uh, in the suttas. The normal word for freedom is vimutti. Vimutti means like liberation of freedom. Uh, and one of the important words you find in the suttas is the idea of ceto vimutti, which is like the liberation or freedom of the mind. Uh, yeah, so the idea that the mind gets liberated from something. Uh, it's a very enticing and beautiful uh, concept uh, in the suttas. Uh, but beyond the idea of ceto vimutti, the freedom of the mind, you also have the idea of panya vimutti. Uh, panya in the suttas is the idea of wisdom. Uh, that is the liberation by wisdom. Uh, liberation of mind, liberation by wisdom. Uh, very beautiful ideas on the Buddhist path. Uh. And so this is really what we are aiming for in Buddhism. And it starts from the very beginning uh, and it kind of gradually develops uh, as we go all the way to the end of this uh, uh, training that we're trying to undertake. Uh. But of course the idea of uh, liberation also has a lot of ordinary connotations to us. Yeah, If you are uh, lib free uh, in an uh, in ordinary society, it means that you are not in jail. Yeah, Being in jail is considered a bad thing, yeah? except if you're a monk maybe. Ajahn Brahm says being in jail is a good thing. Yeah? You know, because you get left in peace, right? In jail, you just hang out in your cell, you don't do anything. Yeah? Ajahn Brahm says he would prefer solitary confinement in jail. That would be the ideal place for a Buddhist monk. Yeah? It's kind of weird, isn't it? How you, it's all about whether you want to be there or not, whether something is a jail for you or prison for you. Huh? So prison is like bad. Why is it bad? Because you can't do what you want. Uh, you can't express yourself in the way you want to express yourself. Uh, you are limited. You are hemmed in. The world is no longer your oyster. <laughs> you can't do what you want in the world anymore. Huh? Yeah, so pr imprisonment, the opposite of freedom, uh, is a big problem, e if, even from a ordinary social point of view. Huh? But of course, from a Buddhist point of view, the real prison huh, is not the prison of steel bars and concrete and high security locks and prison wardens or whatever it is. Huh? That is not the real prison. Huh? From the Buddhist point of view, the real prison is the prison of the mind. Huh? It's the prison that almost everyone is in at all times. Huh? Yeah, you get born into this world, huh? you are in prison straight away. Huh? And then that prison remains with you and for your entire life unless you do something about it, unless you release yourself uh, from that prison of the mind. Uh, the mental prison, uh, that is the real problem. Uh, the way we limit ourselves, the way we look for happiness in the wrong place, uh, the ways we are deluded about the nature of reality, uh, the way we kind of create suffering when actually what we really want to do is to create happiness for ourselves. Uh, that is the problem. Uh. So um, just to backtrack a little bit. I was um, recently in the United States. Uh, I was traveling across the U.S. starting in San Francisco, going all the way over to New York and Boston and stopping in a few places in between. Uh, and uh, one of the nice things about traveling as a monastic uh, is that there's a number, of, I mean, obviously the main reason you go is to teach, yeah, and it's, it's always nice to teach Dhamma wherever you go in the world. Uh, and you know, people always get inspired and they always invite you back again. That's the biggest problem. When you travel, you always have to go back again afterwards. Uh, that's why you never see us here in, <laughs> in Australia, because there's too much demand everywhere. Uh, but so that's one of the, of course, one of the main reasons for traveling. Uh, but one of the great reasons for traveling is that it gives you new impulses uh, as a monastic. Uh, the Dhamma is always the same, uh, but every society has its idiosyncrasies. Uh, and it looks at the Dhamma or asks questions that are slightly different uh, wherever you go in the world. Uh. So whenever you go to a new place, and this was my first time in the United States, uh, you kind of get asked slightly different questions because of the nature of that particular society. Uh. So when I was in uh, Minnesota, yeah, Minnesota, a very cold place. I was there in February. It was freezing cold. I have no idea how cold it was over there. Minus 26 degrees when I was there. Uh. Has anyone ever here been to minus 26 degrees? Uh, no? Okay. You, well, you, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but so, 
I was there, and it was, uh, you know, it's kind of cool because I have a Norwegian background. In Minnesota, as all the Norwegians, Scandinavians kind of went to the U.S. So kind of all these people thought it was really cool that a Norwegian monk was coming to Minnesota. So it was kind of nice. Uh, but uh, the uh, talk that they asked me to give in Minnesota was about constitutional freedoms versus uh, Buddhist freedoms. Uh, yeah, and I never really thought about that before because, of course, in the United States, the idea of constitutional freedoms are very important and significant. Uh, one of the things they proud themselves of in the U.S. is the, con the American Constitution, uh, which lays, that, lays down the kind of basic uh, ideas for the American society, the foundations for that society. Uh. And so they wanted me to talk about, well, what about these freedoms in American society versus the Buddhist way of thinking about freedom? Uh, and it gives a different angle on things. Uh. And of course, one of the interesting things in the uh, American Constitution, in the preamble to the American Constitution, uh, it starts off by talking of life, liberty, uh, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh. Yeah, you know, remember that? Uh, this is kind of one of the kind of famous lines from the American Constitution. Yeah, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and one of the reasons I remember that is because when I grew up uh, in England, back in, I was partly in England back in the 1980s or whatever it was, uh, there was a, uh, I think, it, a, a commercial on TV that was kind of the life, liberty, and Wrangler jeans. Uh, I never forgot it after that, yeah. <laughs> like the pursuit of happiness was Wrangler jeans. Uh. So, and that is kind of a, it's a nice thing, yeah, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it kind of makes good sense. We can see why that is a positive sentiment, yeah, life sounds good, yeah, we don't want to kind of people to kill us, or maybe we do, I don't know, but usually we don't. And then you have liberty, yeah, liberty is nice, especially if you understand what it means. Of course, most people have no idea what it means, but anyway, it's kind of the general idea is nice. And then the pursuit of happiness, yeah, it makes sense. But when you think about it, uh, yeah, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, this was so fun, because fun to, when you go travel around, it's, you have to have a bit of fun, right? So I was kind of making fun of the American Constitution with the Americans. It's always kind of, you have to have a bit of fun and games with people. Uh. So I said, there was a problem with this. Uh, yeah, it sounds really nice, the sentiment is good. Uh, but it's a foundation, fun, fundamental problem uh, with the entire American Constitution. You've got to change it. Uh, yeah, it doesn't work, this Constitution. Uh. That was kind of my point. And I said, the problem with this constitution is that to be able to pursue happiness, what do you need? To be able to pursue happiness, you have to know where to find happiness. You have to know the meaning of happiness. You have to understand what it is all about. If you don't know where to find happiness, how can you possibly pursue it? So I said to my audience, well, Buddhism can help you with that. So we'll give you a few paragraphs, Buddhist paragraphs, uh, and you can insert those in your American constitution, and then you have a good constitution over here. Yeah. And uh, people, <laughs> they kind of laughed. I'm not sure if they were all that impressed, but they kind of laughed at it because they thought it was a bit outrageous. That would be really nice, right? Sometimes we need to combine some of our nice worldly sentiments uh, with a few spiritual ideas. And when we combine them in that way, actually, that is where they start to become really meaningful. Yeah. Because, of course, the reality is uh, that most people, they go into the world and they start to pursue this idea of happiness. The liberty is there, yet that means they are allowed to pursue it. The reality is they tend to look in the wrong place. And of course in America, the idea of the pursuit of happiness is the idea of getting away from the country that you were in. Maybe you were oppressed in that country. Maybe you were not happy or whatever. And you pursue the ordinary happinesses of the world. Yeah, that is actually what you have the liberty to pursue. But actually, from a Buddhist point of view, it is not very profound. It doesn't get you very far. It gets you where it gets everyone else. Yeah? It gets you to the grave eventually. And then you kind of wonder what it was all about. And that's kind of the end of the story. Not all that exciting. So there is a fundamental problem there with this idea of liberty in the world, or the idea of happiness as well. So to really have freedom, yeah, to really, to really be able to use freedom, we have to have some understanding of the underlying ideas of what happiness is, uh, what actually the pursuit of these things really is about. Uh, and if we get it all wrong, then it's going to be problematic. Yeah. Now, one of the aspects also of the 
American Constitution is the idea you have the freedom of speech, you have the freedom of assembly, the freedom of the press and all of these kind of things. Uh, and these are all nice things, yeah? And these are things that uh, the Americans will pride themselves on, that they have these kind of liberties and freedoms uh, in their constitution, yeah? I kind of felt it put into the constitution as one of the fundamental things. Uh, and I think it's okay to be proud of that, yeah? These are good things. Uh, these are things that keep our society in check, keep a balance in society, doesn't allow people to get too much power, which is always a dangerous thing, yeah? So they are good things. Uh, but uh, the prob one of the interesting things, of course, that once you start to look a little bit at uh, Buddhist history, uh, you start to realize that many of these fundamental rights that people have today, one of the rights uh, also as actually freedom of religion, uh, many of these things existed already two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, yeah, we pride, uh, pride ourselves on these ideas that um, uh, that kind of our society is very advanced and very, um, you know, evolved from the kind of early days. Uh, but very often you find that these ideas are not really ideas that belong to the present day. Uh, these are perennial ideas, uh, ideas that have always been around, always been there in society. Uh, and I'm sure if you would be able to look into the really deep past, uh, almost regardless of how far you went into the past, if you went into your past lives, uh, eons maybe into the past, uh, you will see the same ideas recurring again and again and again. Uh, and there's nothing really all that unique about the society we have today, I would think. Uh, and when you, even all you have to do is go back to Indian society uh, and you start to look at that society, you find democracy, uh, you find a very high degree of freedom of religion. Uh, yeah, it's kind of amazing when you start reading the suttas. Uh, you start to see the suttas are the discourse of the Buddha. Uh, you start to see all the debates they were having in those days, uh, all the kind of crazy religious ideas they had. It makes our day seem sane by comparison to some of the ideas they had in those days. Uh, and you might think there are some religious scallywags out there today. There were equally many religious scallywags at the time of the Buddha. Yeah, there were lots of them hanging around, saying all kinds of mad things in those days as well. Yeah. So there was this beautiful kind of um, rainbow of uh, uh, religions. Uh, yeah, all of them kind of arguing with each other, discussing with each other. Yeah. And this is one of those beautiful things about the Indian culture. Yeah. I don't know if you've been to India, but uh, I, I find India very fascinating. Yeah. You have kind of a love-hate relationship with India. It's a very fascinating society because of its religious nature. Yeah. Yeah, so many religious people, and of course, as a Buddhist, when you go to India, it is almost as if you're stepping back into history, yeah. seeing some of those beautiful ancient sites where the Buddha was, where the great Arahants was, uh, where the Bhikkhunis Arahants of the old days were. Yeah. Yeah, and you go back to those places and you actually know it is the place because it looks exactly the same way as it was described in the suttas. Uh, some of the details are exactly the same. Yeah, it's a remarkable thing. Yeah. And you go there and you feel a sense of, weird sense of belonging when you go there. That's what I feel there. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure when I look at my life now and I look at kind of the, web, what the things I enjoy and the things I do in my life, uh, I'm pretty sure I was an Indian in a past life. Uh, there's so many things about India that I kind of just adore. I think it's just, so. There are many things I hate about India as well. Don't say that, but that's actually true. But there are many wonderful things about India, uh, which are really kind of uh, ex you know, extraordinary, especially if you are a Buddhist. Uh, and it would be surprising if many of us here had not been Indian in a past life. Yeah, India is a place with lots of people. India is a place where the Buddhism was extremely strong for one and a half thousand years. Uh, so of course it is likely that we were part of that culture. Yeah. Anyway, so, but India is fascinating and it shows you when you look sometimes at how those societies worked already two and a half thousand years ago, yeah, you start to realize that our society today is not all that special, yeah. it's not all that uh, unique. Yeah. These ideas that we have now of liberty and freedom in our society have actually existed for a very, very long time. Yeah. But um, Coming back to the idea of freedom again, uh, let us start with a simple idea of morality. Uh, yeah? Now I'm going to have a look at the ideas, how it is that uh, Buddhism presents the ideas of freedom. Uh. And one of the things that I think is often misunderstood in our world, uh, many people think that the ideas of morality are 
hindrances to freedom, uh, they hem us in, they put boundaries on what we can do, and we cannot really enjoy ourselves in the world to the full potential. Uh, why? Because morality sets limits on us. Uh, yeah. And uh, for that reason, you will find that there are many societies in the world, and many kind of, maybe not societies, but uh, groups of individuals uh, who decide to live amoral lives, uh, not really taking morality into account, uh, not making it an important part of their life. Uh, why? Because they see it as a hindrance to expression. Uh. But that is a misunderstanding of the idea of morality. Uh. Morality, if you live it in the right way, is actually an expansion of your freedom, an expansion of your sense of um, liberty within her. Yeah? And this is such an important thing to understand, uh, because when you live a moral life, uh, something very powerful happens inside of you. Uh, what happens? You start to feel a sense of self-respect because you're treating other people well. Uh, you start to feel good about yourself because you know that you're living a good life, especially when you really try to perfect that virtue and morality. Uh, you feel a sense of self-value, uh, a self-esteem. Uh, you don't have any remorse or regrets about the past. Uh, you don't have the darkness of the mind or the sloth of the mind uh, because you've done bad things before. Or you've done maybe a few bad things, but generally speaking, you live a good life. Uh, and that liberty that comes in the mind, that is a function of that, uh, that is far more important uh, than the kind of uh, liberty that you get outside. It's the mental liberty that really matters in the world, uh, not the external liberty of enjoying the senses or enjoying power or enjoying these kind of things. Uh. And I really recommend you to notice that, uh, because that is such a beautiful freedom of the mind, uh, not having the remorse, not having the negativity, speaking to you all the time and making your life difficult. Uh. There are many people who complain about lack of uh, self-worth or self-value in this world, uh, well, if you would really want to em uh, emphasize or to increase your sense of self-worth, uh, this is one of the most important places uh, where you actually create that self-worth for yourself. Uh, you really start to feel good about yourself. Uh, you don't care so much about what other people think about you. Uh, this is like a disease in our world, always caring about what other people think. Uh, who cares what other people think, right? Uh, what do they know anyway? <laughs> It's weird how often we kind of we buy into praise. We buy into the praise of people who haven't got a clue about what is praiseworthy. Why do we care about other people's praise? If the Buddha praises you, okay, then you have good reason to care about it. But otherwise, forget about other people's praise. Feel good in your heart because you know for yourself that you are a good person. That is the first liberty of morality. And there is a nice story that goes with this. I don't know if you have heard that story, Ajahn Brahm sometimes tells it. Actually, it is an Ajahn Brahm story. I only retell Ajahn Brahm's story. That's kind of my, that's how I get by when I give this Dhamma talk. So I just think, what would Ajahn Brahm say? Okay, he would tell this story. Okay, I'm going to tell that story. <laughs> and this is a story of, from Thailand, from Ajahn Brahm's early days in Thailand. And it's a story of two very senior Thai monks. And they were invited to a dana. Dana is like a meal offering at someone's house, usually. So they were invited to this dana, and they went there, and this was a very wealthy people living in this house. This is now a long time ago. Yeah, This was probably in Bangkok back in the 1970s or 80s or something like that. I'm not sure exactly when it was. So they get to this house, they sit down, and they get you know, treated, they get a kind of have a nice meal or whatever, and after the meal they start to talk to each other. And as they're talking about it, they note there is a large aquarium, yeah, fish tank, yeah, in that house. And so one of the monks says to the other one, it's terrible, they're keeping all this fish imprisoned in a fish tank, yeah, just for their own enjoyment, so they can kind of enjoy the fish swimming around, it's just entertainment for them, while torturing the fish in the process. How can they do that? Uh, this is bad morality. Yeah? They're doing immoral stuff by torturing these fish in the house. Uh, they should be free to swim in the rivers, to enjoy themselves and do whatever they want in the world. Uh. And then the other monk, uh, he says, but wait a minute. Uh, yeah. He says, wait a minute, because uh, actually, uh, when you look at those fish in the fish tank right here, uh, they have many, many advantages uh, over the fish in the rivers. Uh. First of all, there are no predators, right? The fish in the river always have to look over their shoulder. I'm 
Do they? I'm not sure if fish have shoulders. But anyway, you, they have to kind of look behind them, right? Because it's a bit kind of scary, yeah. the fishy shoulder. That they always have to be frightened, right? Because there's always kind of larger predators around. Uh, or the, the water in the river is never really controlled. In part of the year it is too hot, part of the year it is too cold. Yeah, always problematic with the changing temperature in the water. Uh, sometimes there is food in the river, sometimes there is no food in that river. Uh, Sometimes the river dries out, there's only little puddles left. Yeah, maybe they die in that little puddle. But these fish in the fish tank, yeah, they always have the right temperature of the water controlled by the owner to be perfect for that fish. Always gives them nice and nutritious food, yes, yeah, so they kind of, sometimes they become a little bit too fat maybe, but otherwise they are healthy and nice, right? There's no predators in that tank. If they get sick, they call in the fish doctor. I'm sure there must be fish doctors out there. I mean, there's doctors of all kinds. I'm sure there's fish doctors as well. They call in the fish doctor to look after them. Uh, yeah, so they have this kind of perfect setup. Uh. So who is worse off? Is it the ones who are limited a little bit by the fish tank four sides? Uh, are they worse off because they have all these other things? Uh, or is it those who are free to do whatever they want? But actually, they have all these problems because of that. Uh. And then the other monk, he kind of agreed, yeah, you have a point, yeah. Actually, maybe the fish in the fish tank are better off. And in the same way, we are better off by walling in, putting limits on our desires, limits on our anger, limits on our stupidity <laughs> and delusion, right? Putting some limits, because we are deluded, we don't really understand the world properly here. Yeah and we put limits on that, then we experience a freedom that is far more valuable than the freedom to just mess around in the world. And this is exactly the beginning of this beautiful saying by Ajahn Brahm. This was coined by Ajahn Brahm, I think. The idea of the difference between the freedom of desire versus the freedom from desire. Yeah, you are moving a little bit away from desire. It's more like freedom from desire to some extent that you're finding here. Whereas the freedom of desire, the pursuit of things regardless of the morality you might breach as a consequence, uh, that is a crazy kind of desire, only going to let you down all the way here. So this is how you start to reflect. Uh, yeah, and this is kind of the advantage of coming into... Um, listening to Buddhist ideas, coming into contact with Buddhism, because it allows you a new way of looking at the world. A large part of the world doesn't even understand such a basic idea that morality is a positive thing. And the reason they don't understand it is because they haven't got access to spiritual teachings that point them in that direction. Once you have that access, once you get a degree of faith and confidence in this Buddhist teachings, it opens your eyes to a new world, a new reality, and this is what this really is about. What about other problems with freedom? One of the problems with freedom, one of the kind of things that we need to look at is, well, what about this idea of free will? How much free will do we have? Is there really such a thing as free will? One of the interesting things to look at in your life is to look at your habits. And you start to look very closely, you start to see that we are very habitual beings. We do things according to habits. Yeah. And I always like to think of myself, born in Norway, you'll be surprised the kind of things I eat in Norway. You'll probably be disgusted. Yeah. We eat things like pickled herrings, yeah. we look like fish that has been, has been kind of... Um, Lying in lye, yeah, in alkaline solution, this transparent like jelly, it tastes like nothing, it's just kind of this weird stuff. And you would be absolutely disgusted if you saw these things. Well, as I kind of lap it up, yeah, wow, this is the real the delicacies. And the difference is what? One of conditioning, yeah, yeah nothing more than that. We are such conditioned beings. And if you start to look at your life, the things that you like, the things that you want to do in your life, uh, how your mind works, the people you want to be around, the religion that you choose, the work you're into, all of the things that make up your life. And you start to look back at the cause and conditions that make these things. Uh, you start to see the habits in action in your life. Uh, it was very interesting when I was in the U.S., coming back to the trip to the U.S. again, because you get some new impulses when you go to a new place, as I said before. Uh, 
So I was in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, pretty much the coldest place in the US. It doesn't get much colder than that in the US. Uh, and when I was there, it was minus 26 degrees. Uh, I was there in my sandals, no socks, yeah, the sandals. Uh, I was out for maximum 30 seconds <laughs> because of that. Uh, and it reminded me of kind of my upbringing in Norway because it got really cold in Norway as well. Huh? And uh, but, but it's so weird though. What kind of really kind of shocks you when you go there is that uh, these Norwegians, yeah, come from one of the coldest places in the world. Uh, yeah, I, the coldest pla coldest time in Norway, I was was minus 41 degrees. That was the coldest, uh, and that was really really cold. We can barely breathe at minus 41. It's like <laughs> really <laughs> really kind of terrible. Huh? And uh, so minus 41, yeah, so these Norwegians come from one of the coldest places in the world. Uh, they travel kind of way, way across the world, thousands of kilometers away. Where do they go? The coldest place in that new country. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Isn't that kind of strange? I mean, you have the opportunity to go to Florida, for goodness sake. Go to California, go to Arizona, whatever. Go to a hot place. Don't go to blooming <laughs> Minnesota. But of course, uh, when you understand the human mind, you understand why that is the case, yeah. It is about habit, uh, it's about identity, it's about feeling a sense of belonging. These things are far more important uh, than kind of the temperature around you. Huh? And if these Norwegians were used to very low temperatures, used to snow, used to all of these kind of things, if they went to Florida, they would probably, the, the sense of identity would dissolve, yeah? We can't hang out with alligators in Florida. That doesn't make any sense, yeah? <laughs> How is that possible? So they go to the place where they feel at ease because their identity is attached to the cold, attached to the snow, attached to hard work. You have to work really hard when it's so cold, otherwise you freeze to death, uh, and these kind of things. Uh, so that is why you go there. Uh, that is one of the main reasons why we are creatures of habit, uh, because it it um, indulges uh, our sense of self. Uh, our sense of self demands that kind of continuity, kind of uh, uh, consistency in our life. Uh, yeah? This is kind of scary when you start to see that. Uh, and this is why we do the same things again and again and again. Uh, never really changing all that much. If we change it maybe a little bit, uh, but not too much, because otherwise you start to feel that your sense of self is threatened. Uh. So this is the idea that we are very strongly conditioned. Uh, and uh, there isn't really such a big problem, right? Okay, so what if we are, it can be a problem if you're conditioned in the wrong way, so you kind of you, you know, believe in the wrong teachings or you believe in bad things. Yes, then the conditioning can be really bad. But the fact that whether you like, you know, Australian food, you know, Thai food, Chinese food, French food, Norwegian fish, <laughs> Whatever it is, whatever it is that you, that is not so important, it doesn't really matter all that much. But the point is not so much what it is that you like or don't like. The point is the fact that you are trapped by that conditioning and that there is very little sense of free will there. That is really the point. You start to really question the idea of free will. How much do you choose? And I think if you look at the Buddhist teachings in the right way, you start to understand that actually free will is mostly perhaps completely an illusion. Huh? It is a very powerful illusion. It feels like you have free will. It feels like you're always choosing A and B, right? Uh, it's a very powerful illusion. Huh? But is it really there? And I think the answer is probably no. And if there is something that is a very, very attenuated and small, minor aspect of our person that is free in that way. Huh? And once you start to see that, uh, it starts to become scary. Huh? Because there are things in life that are not innocent. Uh, and one of the things that is not innocent is a thing like anger. Huh? Whether you like fish or you like you know, potatoes or whatever, it doesn't really matter so much. But when it comes to things like being angry and upset with the world, it has very detrimental effects on you and the people around you. Huh? That is where it is scary. Huh? But if I ask you uh, to not get angry at all, not to get irritated at all, not to get upset at all for the next week, at all for one week, yeah. would you be able to do it? I can almost guarantee you that you wouldn't. Yeah, if you can stay one day without getting irritated, that would be a miracle already. Most people get angry or upset or at least irritated several times a day when we go through all the things that we have to do. To stay for a whole week, you almost have to be enlightened, yeah, to not be angry for a whole week, yeah, or at least get very good samadhi, because it actually is a very difficult thing to do for most people. 
And when you see that, you see that you cannot even control your temper in this way. Uh, there's nothing you really you can do about it. Uh, you start to understand what, that you are a bit like a machine. Uh, you get into the wrong situation. Uh, you come with, you hang out with the wrong people, uh, and certain things come out of you, whether you want to or not. Uh, you can't really control it. Uh, or if you can control, maybe you can do it once or twice, uh, yeah, and then you feel exhausted, and then kind of it comes out again. Uh. And that is kind of the scary part. This is the conditioned nature of our reality. Uh. And we start to understand that if there is no will that can actually sort these things out, if will isn't free here, uh, then we have a very serious problem. Uh. We have to recondition ourselves very slowly and very gradually, and then maybe we can escape these really big problems in our human personalities. Uh. The anger, the delusion, the excessive greed, all of these kind of things. Uh. So habit is a very, very powerful thing here. Yeah? I always talk about habits as a super tanker here. Yeah? Yeah, super tanker, this ship going down very, maybe 20 knots an hour or whatever, extremely heavy ship, uh, very, very hard to turn around. Uh, but gradually, gradually you do turn it around uh, and then it starts to, uh, things become different after a while. Uh, but it's not something you can do on the spot. Uh, that is part of the problem. Uh, so I say that there isn't really any free will in the world. If there is free will, it is very small. And if there isn't any free will, well, that kind of makes this whole idea of the pursuit of happiness, liberty, look very different all of a sudden. And I want to then move onto this idea. Well, if there isn't any free will, what does liberty then mean? What does freedom mean if there is no free will? Because the answer, there still is a kind of freedom there. Yeah, but before we go there, before I even look at that to kind of understand what this freedom means, uh, let us assume for a moment uh, that there is actually such a thing as freedom of will. Uh. Let's assume that you can choose whatever you like in this world. Uh. What does that actually mean? Uh? And what you will start to realize when you look at it in the right way, actually even if there is freedom of will, uh, it doesn't really mean all that much. Uh. It doesn't really have many positive consequences. Uh. What does freedom of the will mean for most people? Freedom of choice. Uh. And usually what it means, it means that in the morning when you wake up, you can choose whether you want this cereal or that cereal. Yeah. If you're really adventurous, maybe you have a croissant for breakfast. Uh. Yeah, I don't know if you have that. Have that. Uh. Or if you come here for breakfast, if you're a monk, uh, I'm not going to say what to get for breakfast because you will be so jealous if you heard jealous if you heard what you have breakfast over here. But regardless of what you have for breakfast, yeah, this is kind of the choices that we are dealing with in the normal realm of human beings. You can choose job A or you can choose job B. You can choose partner A or partner B. You can choose religion A or religion B. Religion B always go for religion B, right? <laughs> B for Buddhism. So. Um, and so, but these are the kind of choices we make, and most of those choices are in the realm of the five senses. How much difference does it make in your life whether you choose to have an apple or an orange, whether you choose to have pickled herring or barramundi, barramundi, that's kind of the local fish, right? I see I know a little bit about Australia, so barramundi or pickled herring. How much difference does it really make? And the answer is it makes a tiny bit of difference in your life, but it doesn't really make all that much difference at all. The problem is, in our life, we don't understand where real happiness is to be found. That is the real problem. And because we don't understand where it is to be found, we can't choose it. So if you have freedom of choice, but you don't know where happiness is to be found, what is the point of that freedom of choice? You can only choose within a very narrow framework of things that are really quite irrelevant to your happiness anyway. If you don't have the bird's eye view to understand real happiness, where it actually is, there is nothing really useful about that freedom of choice. It becomes this stupid thing that has no relevance to your life. The biggest problem for freedom, the biggest problem for liberty, the biggest problem for becoming happy is the delusion, the misunderstanding, the wrong view of the nature of reality. That is the real problem. Once you start to open up to an alternative view of the world, once you start to take away the delusion in human beings, seeing the world in the right way, that is where you open up the possibility of real happiness, because now you're seeing the world in the right way. 
This is the problem for freedom. Uh, the problem for freedom is not whether there is free will or not. That's kind of completely irrelevant. Uh. So what does this mean? Uh? Well, it means, as I said at the very beginning, uh, when you come to these Buddhist teachings, uh, you start to read the word of the Buddha. Uh, you start to think about life in a new way. Uh. The first thing you do is you start to realize that actually morality is actually really important uh, for having a sense of internal freedom. Uh. Internal freedom cannot be had without morality, without kindness, without care, without looking after each other in the right way. Uh. There is no freedom without that. Morality is a fundamental aspect of the idea of freedom. You start to see that. You start to practice it. You start to feel it. The consequences come out. But of course, it goes much deeper than that. The Buddha says, if you want real freedom, the real freedom is the freedom of the mind. Where is that to be found? It is to be found in meditation practice, right? You start to practice meditation, you start to feel that the mind settles down. You start to feel there's no more thinking going on in the mind. You start to feel that the body fades away a little bit. Yeah, there's no more pains in the body. The body is kind of irrelevant. Your senses are becoming less important because you have your eyes closed. There's very few sounds going on around you. And you start to feel peaceful inside. What does that feel like? And it feels like a kind of freedom. You are free of many of the irritations of ordinary life. It feels beautiful. You start to realize that some of the ordinary thought patterns that we have, the ill will, the desires that we have, the restlessness in the mind, the tiredness, the lethargy, all of these kind of things, they are not there anymore. And you feel free as a consequence. You start to feel happiness. You start to feel bliss. You start to understand that an other reality is possible. This is what you see through the meditation because initially you just have a sense of confidence and faith in the word of the Buddha. Yeah, this is, opens up your eyes to new reality. Now you can choose. Now you can choose because you, now you know that there is another reality. You know that there's something more in this world than just the ordinary humdrum things of ordinary life that actually are not very interesting, actually quite boring, that are not really real choices at all. So it opens up your eyes to new possibility. Now you can start to make real choices because you know about the alternatives that exist. The deeper you take your meditation, the more freedom you feel, the more you understand this alternative reality in the world, what actually can be done with our lives, where real freedom truly lies, then you have those choices. Eventually, you may reach a state of deep samadhi, deep stillness of the mind. The things that Ajahn Brahm talks about, the jhana state, the profound states of meditation practice. And once you see these kind of things, you understand that ordinary reality of human beings is a very poor thing indeed, a very uninteresting thing indeed. There is something completely beyond our ordinary reality that is so much more interesting than what we normally are interested in. Once you see that, you can never turn back again because you have understood something, you have changed your outlook, your view of the world once and for all. Then you have a real freedom of choice, uh, because now you understand where happiness is. Uh, that is the freedom that we want. Uh, who cares about that ordinary freedom of choice in ordinary life? It's irrelevant. It's our blindness to the possibilities in our life. That is the real problem. Uh. The path goes even further, because after the ideas of samadhi, after the ideas of the stillness of the mind, uh, comes the insights of the mind. Uh. This is what we call the Panya Vimutti, as I was mentioning at the very beginning here. Yeah? The liberation through wisdom. Yeah? And this is the highest kind of freedom. Yeah? When you start to see what is going on even in this area, you can start to choose wisdom in your life yeah? because you start to understand that there is such a thing yeah? as profound wisdom on the Buddhist path. Yeah? Once you see it, yeah? once you know it is there, then you can choose it. Yeah? Otherwise, you can't even choose it. Yeah? So coming to the Buddhist teaching is a profound benefit, yeah? Because it opens up your eyes to these new possibilities. Uh, it opens up just by reading the word of the Buddha. Yeah? If, you are, 
If you are open to the word of the Buddha, if you have the ability to gain a degree of confidence in those teachings, it is already a guide in the right direction. This is why the Buddha is said to be the eye of the world, because the Buddha's eyes are open. He sees, it tells us the reality that he has seen, and it allows us to follow the same track and reach the same kind of liberations. This is what freedom means. This is the idea of freedom of Buddhists. Freedom of the will, forget it, it doesn't matter. It is this sort of freedom that actually is what really is important in life. But there's one last idea of freedom that is actually very fascinating and very interesting. And this is the idea that, well, maybe the whole idea of choosing, the whole idea of willing, the whole idea that the will actually matters all that much, maybe that whole thing is a problem in the first place. Maybe the will is a pain in the... <laughs> wherever, yeah, it's a pain. Yeah, maybe the will is a problem. And one of the kind of amazing things that you find in a meditation practice uh, is like anyone who has done a little bit of meditation will realize uh, is that one of the great benefits of meditation is when the mind becomes peaceful. Uh, and when the mind becomes peaceful, uh, one of the things that is starting to disappear in that mind is the doing, uh, is the will is the activity of the mind, is the choices that are actually being taken away. And the deeper the stillness of your mind, the less will, the less choices is actually happening in that mind. And that is when you start to understand that actually the problem is actually much deeper than we thought it was in the first place. The problem is not that we have to choose the right thing. But the whole idea of choice is actually a problem. The less choosing you do, the less willing you do, the more liberated you feel. Choice is part of the prison of samsara. Choice is part of the prison of personality, of living in the world. Take away choice, take away the will. That is where you find the most fundamental freedom of all on the Buddhist spiritual path. And this is why when you enter a very deep state of samadhi, a very deep state of meditation, yeah, where the mind becomes completely still, there's complete unification of the mind, where there's no desires anymore, because there's no desires, there's nothing to do. Because there's nothing to do, there is no willing, there is no choice, there's nothing happening inside of you, you're not going anywhere anymore, because there's nowhere to go if there's nothing of interest in that world. Yeah? So you are completely content with what you have. Uh, there's no choice. Uh, and at that point, uh, you have find, found the highest happiness uh, that you have ever seen in your life, uh, when there's no choosing whatsoever. Uh. This is one of those very fundamental insights in Buddhism, uh, when you understand that actually the idea of freedom of choice, uh, the idea of free will, is fundamentally flawed because the whole idea of willing itself is actually the problem on the Buddhist path. Give up the will, that is where you fi find uh, the most fundamental of all freedoms on the Buddhist path. Uh. And when you give up the idea of will, uh, when you give up um, through a state of very deep samadhi, which I would argue is one of the fundamental feelings of finding the very meaning of life, uh, you're actually very close to awakening itself. Uh, very close to the idea of enlightenment. Uh, because the will is one of those very fundamental aspects of the sense of self that we have. Uh. If you ask people what they identify with, uh, they identify with the creator, uh, the doer, the willing inside. We are doers in the world. We enjoy creation. We enjoy doing. We enjoy all of these kind of things. We enjoy giving talks. Uh, whoops. <coughs> we should be careful here. Okay, maybe sit quiet instead uh. No, okay, I'll finish off the talk here. So, yeah, so you are very close there to come, be, reaching enlightenment itself because you have seen that one of the fundamental aspects of personality, of the sense of self, actually is an illusion, is a problem. And once you see that, of course, you start to give it up. That doesn't make any sense anymore to hold on to that. That aspect of self actually starts to fall away here. So you're coming towards the very, very profound aspects of the Buddhist path when you see this in the right way. That is where you start to reach the ultimate 
freedom of the Buddhist path. Uh, you penetrate through the idea of non-self. Uh, uh, you penetrate, you see that as it actually is. Uh, and that is where, of course, you find the final, truest happiness of all. Why? Because you have right view. Uh, delusion is gone. And when delusion is cl completely gone, that is when you know where to find happiness. Uh, only by removing the delusion from your eyes, uh, taking it all the way to the full insight on the Buddhist path, uh, then you can choose fully in the right way at all times. Uh, because now you know, finally, once and for all, where happiness is to be found. Um, okay, so that is uh, all I wish to say this evening. Yeah. So, there you are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, are there any questions or comments from anyone? Please, this is your chance to, to ask. Yeah. <laughs> you're very welcome to, if you, there are things you don't understand or you want to challenge something, you're very welcome to do so because that's okay. always nice to have. Eddie, oh wow, what a okay. surprise. Okay, please <laughs> find <it> Eddie. <laughs> okay. Ajahn Brahman, this is a very, very, very strong, I mean, powerful, talk, you know, mm. on freedom, yeah. The Buddha was telling us that we are all trapped in samsara. You know? mm. Now, coming back to freedom, yeah, the opposite of freedom is attachment. Mm. And in, the Buddha was telling us, attachment brings suffering. You know? All right, yeah. So if we work in, in this way, okay, there's another angle from what you're saying, okay, attachment brings suffering. We... The attachment comes from our minds in it. So we have to learn to let go of a lot of all this bullshit going on in it. You know, <laughs> right. yeah. you know we've been conditioned to think of certain yeah. ways in it, you know. Mm. Which which really brings up like we can go on for hours and hours talk about the, 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 the different types of content, you know. Yeah. We have to learn to let go of all this <laughs> nonsense, you know, you know, yeah. in order to free ourselves, you know. Yeah. It comes from our mind. So each time when we have problem, we have to work this way, isn't it? Individual, individually. Yeah, yeah I, you're right, of course. The uh -huh. Attachment is a very big problem because mm. when you attach, then you, you see things in the wrong way, you have delusion, or, so it causes suffering, you're right. Mm. But you know, one of the things is that, um, about the Buddhist path is that um, attachment is a hierarchy. Yeah? Yeah? You, cannot, you cannot avoid attachment if you have an ordinary mind. The worldly mm. mind of ordinary people has to attach. Mm. Because that's the nature of a sense of self, is that it will attach in various ways. So sometimes you can work on those attachments, you can work and work and work, and actually after many years you come back to square one, because mm. you didn't deal with the underlying problem. Mm. So more important than trying to deal with the attachment directly, um, is to practice the Noble Eightfold Path, practice kindness, mm. uh, practice morality. I think you, it's coming, but you get a bit of feedback through your microphone, uh, Eddie. Yeah. So, um, and, and that is the problem. So instead of trying too hard to overcome attachments, you can, a little bit of that you can do, uh, yeah, because it's good to reflect a little bit, but more important is actually to practice the Noble Eightfold Path. And the automatic consequence of practicing the Noble Eightfold Path is that the attachments will be reduced. Uh, yeah, being kind, being moral, thinking words of kindness, etc., etc. Yeah. So yes. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Anyone else want to say anything? Yeah, we have over here. Please. Yeah. Just going back to the fish in the tank. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. If you yeah. were one of those fish, yeah, yeah. would you choose to stay there or leave? That Given the choice. Depends on how wise the fish is, right? Well, <laughs> who knows? If it is an unwise fish, it might actually want to go back into the river. But if it is a wise fish that understands the Buddha's teaching, it will stay in the tank. Yeah. Well, it sounds very similar to the Buddha's early <laughs> life, doesn't it? Say again? It sounds very similar to the Buddha's early life. Was he not a fish in a tank? Uh -huh. What do you mean? Uh? Well, yeah. <clears throat> before he jumped the wall yeah. and nicked off, <laughs> and found enlightenment, wasn't he like a fish? I, I, think, I think he was a fish in the river before that, yeah? He was a fish no, in the river. I mean, <laughs> yeah. His early life when he was a prince. Yeah. He was like a fish in the tank. He was protected and everything like that. 
Uh, I would say he was a fish in the river at that time. There was only after he became a, the Buddha that he became a real fish in the tank. Because that's when he got, to, that's when the morality really it. became strong, right? He was still kind of, kind of slightly wild before that. He hasn't, he hadn't yet tamed all the wild impulses in himself. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's very similar to his early life. He was wrapped up in a blanket in in the um, castle and all that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's many points to that. You can. I mean, one of the problems with that is that even if you, are, no matter how wrapped up you are in the kind of in the castle and kind of cuddled and looked after, or whatever, uh, the re the reality of life is always going to be there. Yeah, the problems of life are always going to be there, yeah? and it's always going to be behind you. And it's really only when you become the Buddha and you kind of become enlightened, you practice the spiritual path that actually those deep-seated problems of life actually become overcome. As long, even if you are looked after like the Buddha was, uh, still you can't really get away from the problems of life. Uh. So, uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, I yeah. got a question to the last part that you said. Yeah, please. Um, you were talking about creating things, and as I understood it, you mentioned we should first go into ourselves before creating anything, as I understood it correctly. At what point would you suggest getting active as some sort of a creator. When is the content um, yeah, good the, enough to spread? The sound is really bad. It's, it's kind of Sorry. a bit hard for me to hear. Can, can, I tr can I please try again? Would you mind? Sorry about that. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. um, yeah. you mentioned that, uh, maybe I'll turn around. <laughs> um, you mentioned that being a creator, um, we should not get too early into the stage of creating stuff. So rather look into ourselves and wait until the content is good enough? Or how would you, could you explain that a bit more? Uh, what, what, what I was saying was that, um, I, I was just talking about the idea of the will and choice and these kind of things. Uh, uh, that, um, uh, the, you know, so much of our life is kind of based on the idea we want to create things in the world, we want to do things in the world. And whenever you do something, yeah, you feel good. You feel good that you created something. Yeah, I'm the creator. We identify with the doer. We identify with the creator inside of us. So you see, some people who are compulsive doers, always doing things yeah, continuously, because that is how the sense of self is gratified in a certain way. Yeah. But there is a profound problem with that, and that is that actually the whole idea of doing and creating and using the will is actually a state of suffering. Yeah. That was my point. And you can only see that when you go into a very deep state of meditation. When the will starts to subside and the will is completely gone, that is when you start to find the real meaning of life. You start to find profound sense of happiness. And that's when you understand that the whole idea of creating yourself into happiness is a delusion. That's what we try to do. We try to create ourselves into happiness by creating things. But actually, the creating itself is a state of suffering. So that's why it is delusion. Is that what you were asking? Something like that? Okay, so that was kind of the point I was trying to make. And so uh, and this is why the states of meditation, one of the reasons why they are so extremely pleasant uh, is precisely because you're giving up the whole idea of doing and, and creating or, and uh, agency and all these kind of things. So, yeah. Over here, Bill. Yeah. Um, thank you for a really, really inspiring talk. It was um, very enjoyable and very deep and profound. It actually helps to um, take me back to my Christian upbringing as a Catholic because that's what we were brought up with, that it wasn't our will, it was God's will. Oh, yeah, yeah. And also... In all the, um, the addiction, the seven-step programs, yeah. they say give, there is a higher power. You must give to the higher power. It's not thy will. Mm. So, um, yes, thank you for helping me to understand more deeply yeah. the actual... Um, the jewel of Christianity that I never understood. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> I think... Okay, so let me just respond to that very briefly because uh, I think there is a slight difference there, yeah. and that uh, th th I, I agree with you with the idea that uh, you know there is no personal will. That is a, is the same here, but I think this the slight difference, of course, would be, and I'm sure you know this already, would be that uh, from Buddhist point of view, we don't see that as 
kind of a higher will that works through us. We just see that as the will being conditioned. Yeah? So the will comes about, or the choice comes about through conditioning, not through a higher power. Yeah? That would be the difference there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I disagree, because yeah. <laughs> you're talking about the Buddha being the higher power. No, no, not really. Because I, we're, yeah. we're, we're yeah. following his teachings for, for our salvation, yeah. so yeah. to speak. Okay, there is a way in, in which you're right about that. I would agree with you, to, because of course the Buddha's uh, teaching does influence our will, obviously, because that's why we're practicing the Buddhist path. Uh, but uh, as a general principle, if you look apart from, you know, if you look at any person, whether they are Buddhist or an atheist or an agnostic, or they worship Thor and Odin, my other favorite gods apart from Buddhism, or they w worship whatever, whatever religion they belong to, whatever their outlook, whoever they are, there's one principle that unites all of them, and that is the principle of conditioning. The will is conditioned, choice is conditioned. It's universally applicable in that sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So let's. Anyone else? No? Everyone happy? Okay. So let's just have a quick look at uh, some questions from outside of here. So we have uh, Wolfram Gabi from Germany. Uh, I'm seriously ill, and that makes my loved one sad to see her. What can I do to ease her worries and fears and give her joy and peace and contentment and strength in s instead? Uh, how can I help her? Okay, so the way to help people when you are seriously ill, or even if you are dying, is to remind them that you know your death, if you are a good person, and Wolfram, I, I'm sure you are a good person because you have been around for a long time, you're practicing in a good way, and good people always have a good future. Regardless of whether you die, regardless of whether you're sick, you have a good future uh, if you are a good person. Uh. That's such a beautiful way of thinking about life uh, because it means that all the problems in the world become far less of a burden on us uh, when we understand that we have a good future regardless of what happens in the world, regardless of what happens to our body. Uh. So tell your loved one that uh, uh, you will be good, uh, Yeah, you will be fine, uh, and she can, if you were to have even worse sickness, or maybe you were to die or whatever, that your future is safe. So she can be happy on your behalf that you are going to a good place. And maybe where you are going, maybe you will be able to kind of you know, wave to her and say, carry on with your life. Yeah, I'm fine. Just, you know, just chill. There's no problems here at all. And that kind of way of thinking about death makes it far less daunting and far less painful experience. So something like that. I have had family members, close family members die, and I never really felt very sad about it. And I, because I knew that they had been good people living in the right way, uh, and I thought they were probably just waving down to me and saying, okay, good on you for being a Buddhist monk, yeah? carry on with that. Uh, that's the right, right approach. Uh, because they were very happy with me as a Buddhist monk, yeah? especially towards the end. <laughs> Not in the beginning, but uh, after a while. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go on to the second question here. Uh. This is from Smitha Tenzin from India. That's really cool. Hello, hello there in India. I'm thinking freedom from fear is probably the biggest freedom of all of your thoughts, because uh, all attachments arise from a fear. Even attachment to food uh, is the innate fear of not uh, getting enough. Uh, what should uh, we do to overcome that? Um, Freedom from fear is uh, probably the highest freedom. Yeah, yeah. Um, it goes. I, th I would say it goes deeper than that. It's quite possible to have a, a full freedom from uh, also from other things that are even more profound, like the sense of self and these kind of things. Or, or uh, not all attachments come from fear. Some attachments just come from wanting to enjoy the world. Uh, there's a number of different things there. Yeah. But um, um, how do you? How do you get uh, to the freedom of fear, presumably, is what you're asking from here. Huh? And the main way of overcoming free fear huh, is basically that fear is always about the future, anxiety is always about the future. Huh? So it is best by living well and starting to understand that you are creating a happy future for yourself by living well. Huh? And it's almost an intuition. Huh? 
you know that you are going to be okay if you live well. It's almost like it feels like that, yeah? If you come from kindness, if you act from kindness, if you treat other people well, if you have metta, compassion for the world, all of these things, you just naturally have a good sense about yourself. Yeah? So just live well. Understand that your future is bright if you are a good person. And then fear starts to subside. And then also your need to attach to food and all of these kind of things will also subside as a consequence. It all comes back to the same basic principles of practicing the spiritual path. Then we have Q from Borneo. His name or her name is Q. Just a Q? Okay, that's like the letter Q in the alphabet. That's interesting. Yeah. So, hello Q. Uh, how are thoughts, feeling, and mind connected? Uh, are monks allowed to have emotions or feelings? Uh, <laughs> what kind of feeling is allowed? Uh, um, I don't think you have much choice about having feelings and emotions, whether you are allowed. If you weren't allowed to have that, you have a serious problem, I think. Uh, so I can guarantee you that all monks, all nuns, all human beings, even the Buddha, had emotions and feelings. Uh, so how are they connected? Well, thoughts are just one particular aspect of the mind. The word mind, citta in Pali, is like an umbrella term, which means all the, con all the mental content you have, that's mind. Within that mind, many things go on. One thing that goes on is thought. Thought is like the movement. Yeah, it's like verbalization or pictures, the movement of the mind, things moving on. That's kind of thinking here. Yeah. Feeling is the depending what you mean by feeling, if you mean emotions, then it is kind of the emotional aspect of experience. Yeah? Whether, you, uh, whether you feel good or you feel bad or you're angry and all of these kind of things. Uh, uh, or it can be like the raw sense of whether you dislike or like something, which is more like the Buddhist idea of feeling. Yeah? But this too is within the mind, it's part of the mind, it's a content of the mind, it's an aspect of the mind. Yeah? The mind can be divided into all of these kind of sub-aspects. Uh, so the idea on the Buddhist path then is to steer our emotions and feelings in a positive direction, yeah? to overcome the negative emotions and feelings and steer the mind towards the positive emotions and feelings. That is the job of the path. It is not to stop having emotions and feelings, but to develop the right kind of emotions and feelings. That is the right approach, the way to think about this. Because emotions and feelings are a fundamental aspect of being a human being. Yeah? Last question from Hai Tan from Perth. If there is no free will, are we still responsible for our kama? Um, whether you are responsible or not, uh, you have to deal with the consequences. Uh, yeah, it's still going to be painful if you make bad kama, going to be painful in the future, so make sure you make good kama. Uh, yeah, this is the conditioning. Yeah. Happens right now, you get conditioned to do good kama. Why? Because you know otherwise you're going to be in pain. Uh, so whether you're responsible or not is irrelevant. Uh, what matters is that there is a causal link between how you act uh, and how you feel. Uh, that is what matters. Okay, everyone, thank you very much. Uh, let's just pay respect to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. Sangha.